Hey guys, I got a new to me trailer right here. That uh, the snowmobile trailer tips tilts, so you can drive your two snowmobiles up on. It's in pretty rough shape. I got it for uh, very cheap, but it needs a lot of work. So I thought you guys enjoy watching me do the things it takes to work on it. First thing is, is uh, well to get it home, I had to drive it almost 100 miles on probably some of the worst tires I've ever had seen. But the nice thing about trailer tires is. They're thick as crap. I mean, they really make these bias ply tires thick, thick. But they're also, especially for these little teeny tires, they're cheap as heck. Um, these tires right here, I think, cost me 18 bucks a piece for a, a tire that'll outweigh, that'll hold more capacity than the trailer can. So that's nice. You know, get rid of these old cracked and split tires. Got to repack the bearings. Needs a fresh coat of paint. The lights haven't been touched in, well they've been touched too many times in the last 30 years. But you can hear those bearings. But they spin good, you know, driving at home 100 miles or so, you know, I had to stop every once in a while. One of the ways you know if your bearings are going to seize up on you and crap out on you is to touch your hub. Kind of a good practice thing. Any trailer you own, you know, when you're filling up for gas after you've driven for a while, just go around and touch your center of your hub. It should be cold cool, cool, cold, um, maybe slightly warm if you have a heavy, heavy, heavy load on it, but this should never feel, you know, never should feel more than slightly warm or hot, because then you're going to seize up bearings and you're going to have a bad day. Yeah, the tire are off and you can really get a better look under here. That doesn't sound good, but apparently somebody's put way heavier duty springs than this called for, but that's not uncommon to see, you know, these springs are the uh, 1750 to 3500 pound springs which are some of the cheapest out there instead of the uh, you know, I mean this probably had 1000 pound springs 1500 pound springs on them to begin with but apparently one of the bolts is missing and put it back or didn't tighten up and it fell off looks more like they didn't put it on but you can get a better view of the axle and there is a good bow this way which isn't good I mean there's an ever so slight bow that way to give the, the tires a toe in and they track a little bit better but that right there and it's bent more on that side over there somebody's back this trailer up into a curb and having such small tires it's almost hit the cur curb you know almost middle of the tire fully loaded and actually bent that axle you know but this is just you know all trailer axles are just a uh, mild steel and they bend right back it's no big deal so we can use some jacks and some leverage and we can get that straightened right back out. Now all trailer axles do have a bend to them and I've talked about this in other trailer videos is they do have a bend up in the middle and the reason for that is the bow up in the middle once you put weight right here it leverages out on the tire and it actually flattens out the middle and makes the tire run smooth and level. So an unloaded trailer if you're driving behind it will have two tires pitched in slightly like this you know just ever so slightly I'm over exaggerating it and as the load applies to the axle onto the leaf springs onto the axle it bends the axle down and they level themselves out well you'll you'll see trailers all the time on the road that have been either way overloaded and they're bent out like this you know driving behind them or there's no load on them in the permanently like this and that's because the trailer axles had way more weight than it's ever intended to do and it's permanently bent but the nice thing is, just being mild still, you can bend it back. So I've just got a chain wrapped around each end. And you want to straighten the axles while they're in the trailer. It makes it easier. But if you're doing it on the bottom, i just got a chain wrapped around here. You just put a bottle jack between the chain and the bottom and press it up. Um, this one, because I'm pushing it forward, I'm going to do sideways. The problem is, is a lot of bottle jacks don't like to operate sideways. So I hope this one actually will... I don't know. Usually don't use them sideways. I'll put this plate on here to distribute the load a little bit. And even this plate, there's a I can feel the bend in the axle, but that'll help distribute it. I might have to loosen this a notch. So you can see the contraption. Decided I needed to bend it a little off center. So I got it chained clear over to that leaf spring and then a chain wrapped around the middle. So I got an even pull on each side, and then it's bowing right there on the brace. And I attached a uh, just a piece of flat iron around each one. I got a nice long handle 
keep myself away from the the jack put the blanket back over it but um measuring it it was roughly about an inch out you know, I can't do it with you guys watching, but it was roughly about an inch out and I was able to bend it back um, to within you, I mean, for a vehicle or something like that, you want about an eighth inch of toe in. So, in other words, you want the inside about an eighth inch less than the, the outside diameter of the tire. So, I'll get it to about that, you know, somewhere between a quarter and eighth is good. You never want toe out where the, uh, where the tires are both leaning out as you move forward or pointing outwards because that'll cause a trailer or any vehicle to just move back and forth and self steer where they're pointing in they scrub a little bit but they uh, they track perfectly straight so I know it's dark but I'll continue on this dangerous venture we're releasing off and you'll see two and a yeah. So we're two and a half. So we're about three eighths of an inch towed in from down from an inch, um, which is a ton better, a thousand times better. So I'll go just a little bit more. Yeah, so anytime I do um, large areas, like trailers and stuff like that, I just spray it. You know how many cans, it would take so many cans of spray paint, and spray paint's so thin that this is just an old Campbell Hossfield gun I bought from the Home Depot 20 years ago for ah, 40 bucks or something like that. Um, they're better than, this actually works way better than the cheap Harbor Freight ones, but just a basic um, gun with a big orifice works good, and I just use... Um, it's, this is a Van Sickle. This is the same stuff I paint, painted my boat with, but um, it's just like Rust-Oleum, except for this stuff is a little better, thicker. The The higher quality paint you have, the more solids in it, so or not necessarily solids, more pigment in it. So you paint something white, it's it, you know one little coat, and the whole thing is pure white, even if you're you know you're painting over rust or anything else. So good paint goes a long way, and I mean this is probably uh, 30 cans of spray paint, you know thickness wise and everything you know and so it's a fraction of the price you know you'd have to spend you know for the same amount of spray paint you spend 150 bucks where this costs you like 30 or something but now it's time to do the tires they're gonna go white um, I see a lot of people do tires a lot of people fight with them so this is what I do whenever I paint rims is you notice I got the brand new tires on the rims well there's a reason why I don't you know I had the whole rim out I could have just painted the rim but the problem is you got to put it back on and you scratch it all up so I like putting the tire on and then breaking the bead or if you got a good tire already you just break the bead enough that you can slide your paper right underneath and this stuff right here is just from the Home Depot as well and it's like two bucks a roll and they come in like six inch uh, 12 inch 18 inch 24 inch something like that I'm out of the small small stuff but I mean it goes forever and it's so much better than newspaper. Newspaper, you're just fighting it. You're spending more time than it's worth. And I'm all about doing stuff cheap, but sometimes, you know, time is money and just your personal agony is money. But you do this where you can slip it underneath the rim and the tire, and it looks a thousand times better. Because I see people, they're, they're sitting there with a the masking tape and they're trying to tape around little pieces, and they, they take it off and they still got paint on the tire. One of my pet peeves, I hate seeing paint on a tire. This way, you get it painted. You can paint all the way back here. It looks professional. It looks like the tire was, the rim is brand new, mounted on a brand new tire. You can't tell. But see, this one's not even broke all the way. This one right here, I broke all the way. I just barely, barely even nudged this one. Actually, I didn't even break this one. This one I just kind of pushed down with my hands. It's flattened the tire and pushed with my hands. I didn't even use a tire machine. But um, you can do that with car tires. Too, with just like a bottle jack, you can just throw a bottle jack um, under the car, under a bumper or something, and just put the bottle jack on the tire and, and pop it down. And then you can even wedge, you know, screwdriver tip or something in there just to hold it open. And then you get your paper in there and paint away, and you'll have rims that look amazing. Kept the old bearings, but 
so you can get a good feel for them. That don't sound good. Not at all. And the other one just fell completely apart. So those bearings are outside their life. So time for new bearings. But generally, even if you've got good bearings, how do you tell if they're bad? One of the best ways to tell whether or not a bearing is going to fry on you, is going to seize up, if even it feels great, is if you look inside on your race, if you see um, lines where these little rollers have sat, if you see little lines, little indent, that means water's gotten there and your bearing's most likely going to fail. It's going to be hard for you to see in there. Um, let's see if we can get the camera to pick up the color. But there's definite lines on the race. But good thing bearings are extremely easy to replace. Pop out both sides. Take a hammer and screwdrivers and just pop out the, uh, the race from the other side. And there it is right there. Just finish taking it out. I got my new race started. And the way I like to uh, reinstall races is you can take a block of wood and you can hammer it over the top, um, get it flush. But I like using the old race. And generally there's a flat side and there's a rounded side. And the rounded side goes down in. So you can't really use that yet. We will use the flat side against the flat side and we'll just tap it. Until it starts going in, but then when it gets in far enough, before this one really starts grabbing too much, like it just barely did, I'm not paying attention. Back it back out just a little bit. There we go, just a teeny bit. Is we'll flip the race around to the smooth side and we'll actually use that to tap it in. And this race will get stuck in there, but we'll be able to use the lip to knock it right back out same way that we did the first time, but it'll slide right out because it's right towards the end. And that makes sure that other one's seated nice and good, and then we can just take our screwdriver and just hook it on the old race. A minute. Get it there. And our old race is out and our new race is perfectly seated. And these are garbage anyway. Seal and everything on, so then you just slide the whole assembly on. You can put this last bearing in afterwards if you want. That all goes in. Got a good amount of grease. Floating in the middle, I like to put a lot of grease in there. And I like to pack a lot of grease around this outside edge where it gets sucked back into the bearing. But I see a lot of people not torque these down tight enough, almost, to be able to um, push to shear that grease off so we want to snug it up and then loosen it same I mean and we want to spin it I mean I'm not screaming tight but I'm tight and that puts metal to metal where you want it and then you can back it up to an appropriate notch which is going to be right there I got no in play to very, very little, teeny, teeny amount. My cotter pin will go straight to the middle. And I can do that a couple times. I can torque it up. Essentially, you know, you want to be on the looser side. You can't always get it perfect. If this one was perfect, it'd probably actually be about right here. But I can't get a cotter pin right there. So you go to the, the next loosest spot. Loose is better than tight. And right there is beautiful. Throw the cotter pin in and we're done. Now it's wheel time. And you notice that. You can see one of the biggest differences is, that's just reflection, um, when you actually 
break the bead, you get a perfect tape line down in there. Um, it's almost like the difference between seeing a car that's been completely disassembled and painted and one that somebody's just really crudely taped around windshields and stuff like that. You know, they look crappy after a while, but this one you can't tell that the rim isn't brand new compared to the tire. So I'll slide that on. Looks like a brand new, well it is brand new, except for the, uh, the rim. But now we'll be able to crazy lug nuts. These uh, male lug nuts. Be able to torque those down. They look beautiful. And the bearing sound, none. The trailer has a slight bend in it because this is the middle bar and nothing's ever been supporting out here, not really meant to. But every time you park a four-wheeler or a snowmobile out here and one over there, this middle brace that goes down the middle, it's going to bend and sag over time. So I've got a chain strapped to each side, a bumper jack pushing down the middle, and I'll just jack it up. And that'll bring the sides back up to about where they were originally and just straighten it out a little bit, make it more level, look a little bit better. Now it's bending up that way just a little bit, and that's what I want. A little bit more stressed out. I'm going to bump the Bumper jacks are dangerous. These things right here, when you're letting it down, watch your face over it because it'll whack you. So, there we go. And it lets you down. There we go, just finishing up the wiring. And one of the nicest things, I mean, if you want trailer wires or even vehicle wires to last, you need to actually solder them. The butt connectors just don't, they don't hold up. And yes, it's called solder in the U.S., not solder. So, you solder them. But, um, solder them and they won't come apart. They won't corrode in between. But also, dielectric grease. Sometimes it's called bulb grease. Put that on everything. So even after I do that, you know, I got these nice soldered connections. Is, uh, I, I just dip each one in a little bit of grease. And that prevents any corrosion sliding up the wire and corroding your connection. But another thing is, is on trailer wires, um, the number one reason trailers' lights don't work is a bad ground. So you make sure you have constant grounds everywhere. This one's grounded right here, and there's dielectric grease under that. But uh, you'll notice this is just extension cord, and extension cord makes amazing wire to run on trailers. So this is ran all the way to the back, and I just need a ground right at the front. Problem is extension cord wires, it's only three, but uh, it holds up extremely well. This will all get wrapped up with electrical tape, with high-end electrical tape. But uh, that should last, I mean, this will last easily 10, 15 years, and that won't give anybody any trouble. So, time to wrap it up nice and good so the connections don't touch. There you go, all finished up. Had a set of three lights right there. They were all boogered up, rusty, so I ripped them off, and I just installed a single. I, I like marker lights. I could have just left it completely off. But these are some funky old school covers that I didn't really want to work with. I had a actually kind of hack this one. I had a uh, an old, very common, well, this cover was busted, the original cover, um, the center out. But this is a very common just square one that you see on a lot of stuff. And so I actually just heated it up and bent it around just to cover up. So you can't really tell, but it's just covering up the center hole. But it looks exact, it's a tail light material, so it looks exactly like a tail light. But it's all done. Everything's all put back together. Um, so now it's time to sell it, get rid of it. Yeah, definitely was a fun project. Um, definitely a lot more work than I thought it would be, a lot more time than I thought it would be. Um, but had fun. Hope you had fun watching. Don't forget to leave a comment below. 
thumbs up, thumbs down. See you guys soon, bye.